Hi, this is mini batching for speed up and scalability of spiking neural networks at WCCI 2020. I'm Cooper Segrist, and thank you for being here. Kinda. I want to start by talking about the reality of spiking neural networks. Spiking neural networks are just not used the same way artificial neural networks are for competitive results. They've shown that they have amazing computational power, and neuromorphic computing is just around the corner. So why aren't they being used? Well, among other issues, spiking neural networks are slow to train. Much slower than artificial neural networks. So I think we need to do something about this. It's a wasted potential. And we did. We see this as an issue of infrastructure. We, implement, and we implemented a general-purpose mini-batch algorithm for spiking neural networks, which we believe is the first of its kind. And we think that this will boost spiking neural networks past the hurdle that has been in front of them for so long with training time. And we think that implementing similar infrastructure, the same way that artificial neural networks had a boom in their infrastructure recently, will cause spiking neural networks to be used as often, if not more, than artificial neural networks. So what we did was we tested our mini-batch technique in two spiking neural network domains. What we saw was that there was a constant time scaling with batch size, and we didn't lose any performance in our experiments. Mini-batching, as you might have guessed, is not... <laughs> it has been done before in spiking neural networks. Uh, it has been so useful in artificial neural networks that it would be insane to not try it on other neural networks. But uh, NendoDL's implementation, for example, doesn't support online learning. This will hinder a lot of spiking neural networks, and what we wanted to do was make a general purpose method. Our implementation will duplicate the stateful quantities of our neural network b times, where b is the batch size, but it will keep the stateless quantities as a constant. This is to not have to duplicate them because we don't need to. After these B quantities all change independently, we aggregate the changes and then we choose a method of aggregation. We use averaging and maximization in our experiments. We implemented this on the Binds Labs BindsNet SNN simulator, um, and it is now a part of BindsNet if you want to check it out. So if we have our spiking neural network here, and we want to train it using batching, we duplicate it, b times, uh, just the weights. In this case, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't take the voltage thresholds into account or anything like this, because it would be the same through all of them. Then we feed in our images to each of them, and we produce some weight change from each of them using SCDP, or whatever learning rule you'd like. What we do is then we aggregate uh, from these changes that we got, and we could either average it using a simple algorithm or a simple math, we can maximize it or we could take the minima minimization or whatever method you'd like. Um, there's a wide variety of what could be tested here and of course there is with other batching methods too. First, we demonstrated the scalability of mini-batching. So what we did was we created a simple two-layer network with 100 inputs and we had Poisson spike trains feeding into them into a variable-sized uh, layer of leaky integrate and fire neurons, which are the LIF neurons. Then we created randomly sampled weights and then we ran it. So we ran variable batch size and then either enabled or disabled a simple online SCP learning rule. And then we just, just we wanted to see the difference in time in training it uh, with batch and in just simulating it. So we took our one layer network our two-layer network, our first layer of n input neurons, which is 100 here, feeding into m output neurons, which will be variable. So we have n equals 100, and m is all of those values. And then we fed in Poisson noise into the beginning, and we simulated the entire thing, either with training or without training. And here's what we saw. So what you'll notice immediately is the one outlying bit, which is this. This point is where the batch size of, like, the batch to networks overtook the CPU memory, or GPU memory. This caused a loss of the constant scaling that we were seeing across the board, and of course we have constant up until that point, as we see in the rest of it. So even like training between uh, 1,000 
batches, um, training and not training, we see just a constant scale, except when the memory is overtaken, just like in artificial neural, neural network batching. So in the second case, we wanted to test the performance of our batching. We use the Dale and Cook ETH model for unsupervised MNIST classification with variable batch sizes. Although very large batches caused failures with default parameter reduction, which is the averaging that we were talking about, we were able to mitigate this by using the maximum instead. And there are reasons why this would uh, make sense. So for the, uh, I'll go over the ETH model a little bit because I think it is a criminally under utilized network. Uh, so we have 784 input neurons, which is 28 by 28 for MNIST, feeding into 100 label neurons. Um, now there is a fully connected layer of excitatory neurons going to the label neurons, that's what our input is, and then the labels are fully connected within themselves, they're uh, laterally inhibited, where only one of these neurons are able to fire at a time. The first one that fires will fire and the rest will be inhibited. We then feed in our image, which is converted into a spike train by Poisson encoding, and this causes one of our neurons to fire in the label, and we will say that that is the 8 neuron. Now, we don't actually have the labels, so we don't know that's an 8, but it will, we will have a trend when we go to testing. Um, what actually happens is that this is fed in, it causes this neuron to fire, and when this neuron fires by SCDP, all of these connections are increased and we see that the voltage threshold also increases, which means that it's less likely to fire the next time it's shown an image that is not an 8, or is not similar to this image. And because of that, over time, we see that the weights actually start to approximate a filter, an image filter of what an 8 is. And we see that we can actually label it like this. So a visualization of all of the labels, all the label neurons, will give us something approximated like this. Um, it's a useful method, but it only develops simple filters. So what we saw when we ran this experiment with variable batch sizes was that we didn't actually have much of a decrease in performance uh, at all. And actually, to our surprise, we saw better performance in some of the batched models over the unbatched. We see in here that the, um, that the non-batched is the one batch size, performs fairly well, but then uh, decreases. What we saw was as we increased our batch size to a certain point, up to 64 in fact, um, we saw that the performance would increase slower, but would actually have a higher maximum and wouldn't degrade over time after a certain point. Um, we saw similarly that in large batch sizes it didn't degrade and it did reach nearly the same results, but never reached the same uh, maximum as 64 did. We also have some issues that there were conflicting results between the larger batch sizes, um, where, of course, one neuron will fire, but it's possible that the same neuron will fire for two different inputs into the batch, and if that happens, then they would either be negated or would be mixed into a bad result. Um, we also tested the wall clock speed of how quickly each of these methods converged to 80% accuracy just as a benchmark, uh, it's about our average performance over a uh, long period of time. We saw that it decreased, as you'd expect, up until 64, but then afterwards increased. Again, for the same reasons we were talking about, um, but what is interesting is how quickly 64 was able to converge to that point. Quicker than unbatched and quicker than the others in wall clock time significantly. Um, this reduced it from conversion time for the single batch of in the range of multiple hours to multiple minutes. Um, this difference in the scaling was essential for getting good long-term results. So our takeaway from this is that batching has proven itself that we can actually train our networks for longer and that we may get better generalization and it has the same effect on spiky neural networks that we see in artificial neural networks. As the spike neural networks are able to use the same sort of infrastructure that ANNs have been given over time, we think that spike neural networks may overtake ANNs as the state of the art. It's becoming a real possibility with the increase of neuromorphic computing, and if we see similar infrastructure increases, like we have batching now, but if we have you know, convolution and any of these other tools that we use in artificial neural networks that have you know, blown the performance out of the water, we may see some similar boom in spike neural networks. 
And we hope that more tools like this are developed, and we believe that if enough tools like this are developed, then spiking neural networks may become the next generation of spiking neural, of neural networks, like they've been called. Thank you.